Okay, well, hello and um, welcome, bienvenidos to this Global Adaptation Month session hosted by EcoAdapt National Adaptation Forum. I'm Molly Johnson, Associate Scientist at EcoAdapt and organizer for today's session, Nature-Based Adaptation Solutions. I'd like to go through some housekeeping rules before we begin. Um, so to help reduce feedback, please uh, make sure you keep your telephone, cell phone, or computer on mute, um, even if you're using the voice over IP option. Um, please also use the question function to control your, um, <laughs> on the control panels to submit your questions or report any technical issues you might be encountering. And my colleague, Catherine Braddock, will be able to assist you. Um, we'll be recording this session for future viewing on the, and posting it on the Climate Adaptation Knowledge Exchange at, at cakex.org. Should be available online next week. Um, additionally, the slides for today and the presenter information are available for download in your handout section. So you can follow along that way if you'd like. And finally, two of our presentations were pre-recorded. And so when we get to that point in the session, I just want you to note um, that sound for those videos will only be available through your computer speakers. Um, so keep in mind that if you did call in over the phone, you will not be able to hear this portion unless you turn on your computer speakers. Um, so, and if you have any trouble with that, um, once again, reach out in the questions uh, tab and Catherine will be able to assist you. So I'd like to um, introduce our panelists for today. And um, with us, we have Natalie Snyder, who is the director for the Coastal Resilience Program at the Environmental Defense Fund. We also have Dr. Ralph Chilin, who is the senior advisor at the Ministry of Infrastructure and Management in the Netherlands. We have Queen Quet, who's the chiefess of the Gullah Geechee Nation and founder of the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition. We have Baruch Figueroa Zavala, who is the program coordinator of the Coastal Ecosystems Program um, at Centro Ecologico Acumal. And we also have Alpha Tayamba, who is the leader and program manager for the Population and Development Initiative. So welcome. Um, and with that said, I'm going to pass it off to Natalie to get us started. Thanks, Molly. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today and to chat with you, especially with this amazing game on panel um, that we have from around the world. Um, so I am going to kick us off and just talk about how the power of nature can really help us tackle climate change. Molly, next slide. So one of the key things that we have to, and the complexities is, is we have to look at these multiple coastal threats and they're all increasing. So tidal sunny day flooding from sea level rise, you have storm surge and waves and the intensity increasing and then extreme rainfall events um, causing river floodings and stormwater back flooding. And globally, these costs of, of rising seas could reach 14.2 trillion in lost or damaged assets. 68% um, of that cost could be attributed to tidal and storm flooding and 32% just to sea level rise. Um, and it could cost 100 trillion in the GDP enormous, enormous and complex interactions of compounding and multiple thread, flood threats. Next slide. But what we look for is, and how to tackle these is a multiple lines of defense. And we have to use all of the assets that we have to collect water, to store water, and to protect our communities um, behind natural features. Um, and so from a coastal system perspective, uh, you can have multiple features that uh, reduce sea level rise flooding, tidal flooding, and storm surge flooding, as well as can capture riverine flooding um, from the barrier islands, marshes, forests, floodplains, um, and then to your more traditional gray infrastructure of floodgates, levees, um, inadvertent uh, protection, such as some of our highways that were built that that do offer some of that, um, even inadvertently. And then um, interior water management, really important what, how our stormwater drains are gonna um, keep up with the, the challenges of climate change. 
and then what do we do with the communities? We elevate buildings, we can relocate communities, um, and uh, saving lives is evacuation as a, as a key piece there as well. Next slide. So this holistic approach we need to take is not being taken um, throughout the, a lot of the core uh, studies and, and the federal studies. So for instance, in protecting the New York and New Jersey Harbor region, um, you may have heard of the big gates, but those are not the answer. Um, if we, the study focused only on storm surge and so sea level rise and rainfall risks were considered residual, but those risks are so great and they're so costly both from an economic, environmental and social uh, perspective that we can't ignore them and we can't look at just one flood um, risk independently to make the right decisions. Um, there's long construction time frame, 25 years to complete funding and that's when you get funding for a $119 billion uh, gate project. Um, so while communities are waiting 25 years plus uh, how are they dealing with these flood threats? Um, so we're, we're pushing off this protection so far in the future, it's, it's pointless to the communities that are at risk. These big gates can also induce flooding on adjacent communities. Um, and it's been shown in New York that the sea level rise causes an exponential increase in the gate closures um, and the frequency and as, as well as the duration in which those gates would be closed and that increases the probability that you would have riverine water trapped and flooding from the riverside. So if we don't look at these things um, collectively, we're, we're actually exacerbating other flood risks. And of course, these gates have huge environmental consequences from altering tidal flows and flushing circulation, degrading water quality, affecting species, um, both of commercial and recreational value, um, impacting ecology, habitat degradation, and the list goes on. Next slide. A similar study that was done in Boston Harbor region um, actually looked at big gates as the solution as well, but then a green river ribbon Green Ribbon Commission um, really said that, that these big surge gates are not effective approach for their city. Um, that shore-based solutions, um, including natural infrastructure and non-structural solutions um, can more quickly at a lower cost offer several key advantages to any kind of barrier system. It also provides that flexibility needed to adapt and respond to the changing conditions because we don't know exactly what the future holds. Um, it allows for technology innovations to be brought into the solutions over time and incorporating new information as it's available. Next slide. And so natural infrastructure really provides a more holistic approach um, to how we solve some of these flood risk problems by also offering the flood risk reduction we're looking for. It can protect from multiple flood threats, um, not just one. And has a multitude of other social and economic and ecological benefits such as species and habitat diversity including those fish species that are so important to our fishers along our coasts improved water quality um, protecting groundwater um, and drinking water supplies both for communities and for agriculture um, restoring natural processes and being more sustainable into the long term um, can sequester carbon, which is important to um, reducing the, the future impacts of climate change. Um, recreational tourism and just general quality of life of people who live on the coast. Um, lower costs, as I said, and more timely so they can be implemented more quickly. And then there's a lot more synergies with non-structural and potential retreat solutions with um, communities that are just too vulnerable to stay where they are. Next slide. So this is just some examples of going all the way up into the basin and thinking about how natural infrastructure can be implemented throughout a watershed. Um, on the riverine side, looking at um, floodplain management, looking at how we uh, best management practices for agriculture, stream restoration, um, and next slide. And then all the way down to the coastal system, where you could have levee setbacks um, to allow the, the river to um, take more of its floodplain, 
um, hydrologic restoration, and then your coastal systems that are so important from the barrier islands, coral reefs, um, mangroves, living shorelines, um, and then dunes and um, barrier shorelines. And then within your cities, there's a lot that you can do there from bioswells and rain gardens to help with any kind of stormwater issues. Next slide. So really thinking about the three approaches that we could take to how we deal with our coastal systems, you can defend, and this can be with man-made or natural features, um, but to defend where you are. And some of those natural infrastructure features are the beaches, dunes, oysters and coral reefs, mangroves, maritime forests, and wetlands. Um, we can adapt, which is living with water um, and, and you know, allowing water to come in at times, um, using natural defenses and then things like raised structures and infrastructure. Um, and then finally, there is the retreat option, which is gonna be essential in some communities. And that opens up, once those communities have been relocated, um, that opens up their, that area for natural defenses for communities further inland. And so having that coordinated and not ad hoc approach to uh, coastal retreat is really important to be able to um, provide that protection, protective landscape for the future. Next slide. So I wanted to highlight one project in particular um, that might be interest to folks here, and it possibly, don't know, is the largest single restoration project in the world that's about to be undertaken um, in Louisiana. And um, this graphic shows uh, the Mississippi River going past uh, an animated New Orleans, um, and then reconnecting the Mississippi River with its floodplain, which the Mississippi River has been constrained by levees for well over 100 years, um, leading to the loss of 2,000 square miles of land. And in the future, um, that could double. And so without reconnecting the river, using it as the resource um, that it delivers the freshwater nutrients and sediment, um, Louisiana's future is pretty grim. And so this project um, would create a canal um, through the levee that would deliver 75,000 cubic feet per second or 2,100 cubic meters per second at full capacity of freshwater nutrients and sediment into those wetlands to rebuild. The project would cost approximately $2 billion to complete. Um, during the process, uh, it would create over 12,000 jobs. Um, and then it would uh, result in 1.4 billion increase in local sales. So, Remembering that natural infrastructure not only provides um, the benefits to the ecology, but there are social benefits to the, to the local region as well. Over uh, the first 30 years of operation, the diversion would build 17,300 acres of land, um, which is over 70 square kilometers, um, and, accounts, and that would account for 20% of the remaining marsh. So we've lost we would lose almost 80% of the existing marsh in this watershed, in this basin, um, with sea level rise and subsidence. Um, with this project, 20% of that could remain, which is a substantial amount considering where we are. So as a natural infrastructure feature, uh, this project protects New Orleans region from storm surge and sea level rise. It also creates uh, a multitude of habitats and starts to correct um, the issues of that we've made in the past, like the bad economic decisions we've made. Well, they weren't bad, I'll take that back. But the, the short-sighted economic decisions we've made um, to levy the river for flood protection and for economic development of navigation um, at the cost of our coast. And then because we're, because saltwater has been allowed to intrude for over 100 years into these areas by reestablishing the connection with the Mississippi River, we will be changing where some species are living, um, species uh, composition, and uh, that could have impacts on the user groups that use them. And so there is um, substantial mitigation efforts um, and stewardship efforts underway to um, understand what those impacts are and to put in place um, funding that will can be used to mitigate those, those impacts to those fishers in their communities. But ultimately without these projects, 
um, you will see a decline in species, you will see a decline in um, the diversity of habitats, and you would have much more severe uh, storm and flood damages into the future. Next slide. So what needs to happen to really get natural infrastructure integrated more? As I said, um, from, a, from a federal perspective with the Corps of Engineers being in the US, the main um, driver of these studies, um, there really needs to be a more focused approach on multiple flood threats, the interactions of those flood threats, um, both independently what those flood threats mean to communities as well as, as compounded um, flood risks. There obviously is, needs to be, and I think there's a starting emergence maybe of a shift from post-disaster investments to pre-disaster mitigation. And we need that to be the new norm that we are investing up front um, in natural infrastructure in coastal resilience, um, as opposed to always paying way more money um, after the fact. Um, we need some design guidelines for natural infrastructure. It exists for some like dunes and barrier islands, but not for all. And there is um, some international guidelines that will be coming out later the, this year um, that hopefully will move us in that direction. That I know that um, uh, the Corps of Engineers and representatives from the Netherlands and others have been involved in. We need continued quantification of the risk reduction benefits. Um, and the other ecosystem services that are provided by natural infrastructure. We need to revise our cost benefit analysis methodologies to integrate better the social and ecological benefits and project selection. So as you can see at the end of my slide, policies to end systematic inequality and racism and flood risk, there is a flood risk gap that is growing. And as climate change continues to bring more and more flood threats, that inequality in who is suffering the damages of those uh, floods is gonna grow. Um, and that is largely because we base our decisions on who, where and who we're going to protect and invest in flood risk reduction is based off of property values. Um, so we need to change um, that dynamic uh, quickly. Uh, we obviously need increased funding, as I said, pre-mitigation funding um, and innovative funding mechanisms, um, engaging the private sector, um, insurance, banks, the financial markets, um, all are gonna suffer from a loss in GDP. So we need to engage them in that. There needs to be capacity building and technical support specifically for small, low-income low and minority communities so that they know exactly what they need and how to plan for uh, the future floods. We need to also protect what we have existing um, as far as natural infrastructure and make sure that we don't lose um, additional uh, protection that we have today. And then more documented case studies and, and monitoring of existing products, projects. And just to reiterate again, there is a horrific uh, long-standing systematic inequality and racism and flood risk and in the policies and the drivers of the investments, um, and that has to change. Next slide. So with that, I thank you for your time and I look forward to the discussion and answering any questions. Thank you, Natalie. So at this point, I'm going to bring Ralph to share about his work. Um, and just a reminder, if you have any questions from Natalie's presentation or the upcoming presentation, um, make sure to enter those into the question feature. All right, here you go, Ralph. Ready when you are, Ralph. Um, th this is not my presentation. Yes, this is better. Thank you, uh, Molly, uh, for giving the media opportunity to talk about uh, the application of nature-based solutions in an engineered lowland river system. Um, and also, uh, thank you, Natalie, for uh, your presentation, because I think my presentation really aligns with yours. Um, but I'm going to speak about rivers. Next slide, please. 
So setting the scene to start with, um, uh, on the, in, the, in the left you see the United States, you are familiar with that, and then in the middle you see a very small round circle, circle and that is where the Netherlands are, and I am from the Netherlands, I'm talking about that situation. So next slide. If we zoom a little bit in uh, uh, on, on Europe, then you see the Netherlands again in the red circle, uh, close, um, well, surrounded by uh, different countries like, like uh, Germany and Belgium, uh, located on the North uh, Sea. And in the uh, white picture, you see uh, again a little bit zoom in in the Netherlands. And you also see the rivers, the big rivers that we have, the Wine River and the Meuse River. And I should mention that the Wine River bifurcates into three different branches, which each have, each have uh, different names uh, in two separate uh, bifurcation points. And uh, these rivers, one and most, they have uh, shaped the Netherlands uh, over the past few millennia. And in the last couple of centuries, these river, rivers have evolved towards the current, very engineered river system that we have now. And managing these rivers and this river system is a very important task from flood safety point of view and also from economical point of view. Next slide, please. But if you, if you look at these systems, and therefore I'm, I'm especially glad that uh, Natalie already introduced, uh, uh, let's say, New Orleans, Mississippi uh, system and Mississippi Delta. Now on the, so on, on the right picture, I showed that, the Mississippi Delta with the city of New Orleans. And on the left picture, I showed the wine Meuse Delta in the Netherlands. I rotated the Netherlands a little bit and I located the, the city of Amsterdam. And then if you look at these two pictures, then you can see that both uh, that although the, the United States and the Netherlands differ in scale, with respect to their rivers, there is some similarity. Although of course the Mississippi is still way bigger than uh, than the wine system, but these are similar systems. Uh, they are both uh, lowland uh, um, systems. They are floodplains. They are running through urban areas, and they are both uh, discharging to uh, to sea. So that that. Uh, in itself already points out the importance of these kind of seminars, seminars uh, internationally uh, oriented, where we meet uh, each other and where we can learn from each other on the operations and maintenance point of view. Next slide, please. So coming back to the Netherlands, uh, again, we are uh, uh, a small country. Uh, west to east is about 200 kilometers, north to south is about 350 kilometers. Um, we have an uh, engineered river system. I, I really uh, emphasize that. Uh, we started uh, ma maintaining and managing that uh, as early as uh, the year 500 AD. Now we are um, uh, together with 17 million people, um, and you should realize that about 25% of the Netherlands is below sea level. So that's the more dark uh, part of the, of the left figure. And if you would remove all the embankments and the dunes and the uh, um, uh, dams, the bigger dams, then uh, about 66% of our country is, uh, is uh, prone to, to flooding from either the coastal uh, side or the river side. So that means really that, that proper water, water management is a matter of national survival. If you do not do that well, and we are facing um, uh, breaches and embankments, then this will, will really um, bankrupt the Netherlands as it is actually. It also means that water is an opportunity, and this opportunity comes again down to applying uh, nature-based solutions in proper river management. Next slide. Now, this is perhaps how you, how uh, some of you may know the Netherlands. So it's 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 a it's a beautiful country. We have uh, old trade cit trade cities. They are lying along the rivers. Uh, of course, we have our uh, levees, um, uh, embankments, windmills all very organized and, and um, uh, very well maintained. On the other hand, we still uh, once in a while also feel the threats of, uh, of the rivers and that is depicted here. So it's still quite organized, but that is because of a high, highly engineered and maintained system. So whenever there's a very high discharge in the river, then the floodplains inundate, which is of course wide because floodplains have to inundate and the water is coming near to the crest of the dikes. So on the other hand, a very nice scenery, on the, uh, and, and on the other hand, you also um, uh, face sometimes, every now and then, the threat of the water. Next slide. Now, this is a small uh, movie of the high discharge event that took place in January 1995. So then you can see more or less the threat that the water can cause. Um, you see a kind of a sea of rivers um, from, from one embankment to the other one. 
the, the water is just uh, a few inches below the crest of the dike and at certain points we also we, we already had to reinforce um, the dikes. At this occasion nothing happened, so the last real flood from river point of view was in 1926. But during this event we had to uh, evacuate about 250,000 people um, because we really couldn't trust the, uh, the state of the dikes anymore. Next slide. Yes, so if if this is your problem, so uh, um, depicted in the in the left hand side, so um, water coming to the crest of the dikes and be, uh, immediately after the dikes after the dike you have a village, um, and of course you can imagine what happens if this dike reaches. So if this is your problem, what could be the solution? Well, the old school solution is actually to to reinforce and um, and strengthen the dikes. But that was uh, not longer considered to be a robust solution. Um, you cannot continue just by strengthening and, and reinforcing the dikes. So that means that in around 2000, we, uh, we took another approach and that was uh, giving more space to the river, more room for the river. And uh, basically that means increasing the discharge capacity and that um, means that you are reducing the flood levels. And you can, you can do that in a, in a number of ways. You can get rid of all the obstacles in the floodplains, you can excavate the floodplain, you can uh, uh, dig side channels, and that is essentially what we did in the Room for the River program. Next slide. So this is a very um, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, program, and lots of measures, about 35 uh, located all along the, uh, the Dutch wine branches. It's a 2.3 billion euro program. So that's, that's, that's really expensive, uh, but it was necessary uh, because this, this flood event in 1995 acted as a wake up call and we really had to do something. So it had two goals. Uh, first, flood safety. Uh, so we wanted to reduce flood water levels, but also to increase the spatial quality. And spatial quality is a kind of a complicated concept that includes opportunities for nature, uh, says something about the diversity of the landscape, how a measure or an intervention fits into the landscape, et cetera. So you could couple that to the benefits of NBS, that, uh, of nature-based solutions, that uh, Natalie uh, actually already talked about. So although Room for the Web is, is about safety, it's also about nature and spatial quality. Next slide, please. So here are some, some preliminary uh, examples in, in an early state of execution. So the first uh, um, word in the caption is always the city, and the second one is the name of the river wine. So it's not all wine, but they, as I explained, after the bifurcation points, they get different names. Some characteristics of the uh, of the rivers: uh, the navigation channel is about 100 to 300 meters wide, six to eight meters deep, and the floodplains vary between 100 and 500 meters on either side. And this this really gives opportunity to apply the nature-based solutions and to connect floodplains to the river again, actually exactly as Natalie already pointed out. So, um, <clears throat> well, there are uh, typical, uh, these are typical room for the river measures which increase the discharge uh, capacity, um, but they also try to align a little bit with uh, how the river looked like many centuries ago. So connecting again the main channel to the floodplains and hence also increasing possibilities for increasing biodiversity, nature, recreation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. So they, they come in, in, in different uh, scales. Uh, some are very small, others stretch out over several uh, kilometers, like you see here on the left uh, picture. It's a part of the river Isel near the city of Deventer. Deventer is a very old trade city. And the total project area is about uh, nine kilometers or 5.1 miles long, and it stretches about uh, over 230 acres. So all the blue circles are secondary channels, side channels, um, which have been uh, added to the river in order to increase this discharge uh, capacity, in order to reduce flood level, um, uh, the flood water levels. And on the other hand, on the other side uh, of the uh, on, on the right hand side of the screen, you see a, a view of the iconic project near the city of Nijmegen. The city of Nijmegen is perhaps well known from World War II. And you should realize that the uh, branch on the right hand side in this image is completely man made. And um, again, safety uh, in this case uh, is, is the main purpose, but it also offers a lot of possibilities for, again, recreation, 
nature, um, uh, city development, because this, this actually generates a complete, complete new riverfront. Next slide, please. Now, this is a project in a more advanced stage, so you, you already see that it's really well developed. Uh, again, you see the side channels and you can imagine that this really um, uh, gives a lot of opportunities for, um, uh, for reconnecting the, the floodplains to the main channel and increasing bio biodiversity, nature, et cetera, et cetera. So it also adds to, the, to a feeling of general well-being. Next slide. And this, this, general, this feeling of general well-being connects very good to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are accepted by almost all the countries in the world, and they consist out of goals and targets and indicators. And actually, nature-based solutions are a way, so it's not the way, but it's a way to contribute to achieving these uh, United, uh, um, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, and hence add to um, peace and prosperity for people and planet, just as the, uh, the SDGs uh, try to. So in order to really connect the nature-based solutions to the SDGs, we need a framework for that, and we are really working at this at that right now. Next slide. So nature-based solutions not only work in a bigger system like the Rhine River or the Mississippi River, but they also work in smaller systems. So it really depends where in the catchment you are in order to, uh, to make sure what kind of NBS uh, you would like to apply. Natalie already spoke about the leaky dam. So there's an example on the left-hand side of a leaky dam in the Ellison Water in Scotland um, that you typically apply in some in a tributary or in the headwater of a, of, a, of a bigger system, but typically would not apply in a system like the Mississippi or the Rhine River. Next slide. And as Natalie already uh, told, we are now working on a, a guideline uh, on national nature-based features. Um, this is a cooperation between uh, the American um, Army Corps, the Dutch Rijkswaterstaat, and the uh, Environment Agency from England. And in that uh, guideline, we also collect many examples of um, uh, nature-based solutions on all different scales from all different countries. Next slide. Also within Europe, we are um, cooperating together on the application of nature-based solutions. Uh, in what we call interreg projects, those are European projects. Next slide. And here you see some, some examples where we try to um, apply those nature-based solutions. And what is really interesting is to see that th these are different scales, different geometries, uh, different governance and legislation, legislation, and also different interaction with stakeholders. And if you just put that all together, there was a lot to learn from each other and a lot to, uh, to take into account. Next slide, please. So now I'm, I'm almost at the end of my presentation. If you look at the lessons learned, and again, uh, this really fits quite nicely by the, uh, the things that Natalie said, um, I think it's still important that we create a solid performance evidence base for building with nature and solutions. And for that, we need a, a, a really objective assessment framework. We have to agree on how to value multiple benefits and functions. And we have to support member states in implementing building with nature and national regulations. And again, uh, international cooperation, looking at different systems, looking at how the, the problems uh, over there are and how they are solved with nature-based with nature solutions really helps in this. Next slide. So if you then uh, think about the future directions, um, this assessment framework, this development of an assessment framework in which you can can in, on an objective base uh, compare the different nature-based solutions and connect that to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is really, really important. I also want to address the importance of monitoring and adaptive planning programs, and then monitoring should really be long-term monitoring. Invest in support all, uh, at all levels from local authority to international law, so start really local, but also the global, the, the, the national uh, level is very important. And it should inspire new stakeholders and stimulate participatory decision making. So then I end with my last slide, the takeaway uh, message. I think it is really important that on all scales, nature-based solutions should be an integral part of the flood risk management evaluation. 
and they do go along with multiple co-benefits and contribute to a general well-being. And perhaps the best uh, takeaway message comes from Theodore Roosevelt. This is a sign that I saw in one of the national um, uh, parks at uh, near the city of Vicksburg. We must ask ourselves if we are living, if we are leaving future generations in an environment that is as good or better than we found. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph, for your great presentation. At this point, I'm going to welcome Green Quest. Ethan Blessings. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God, why trouble the water? Plenty of people all around the world don't get it. Some are on a chill and crack your teeth with them and things like that, Eddie. But plenty, people ain't no see. This your thing. Come from right where they did. In the Gullah Geechee Nation. This year, a line that going from Jacksonville, North Carolina down to Jacksonville, Florida, or the southeastern coast of the United States and things like that, Eddie. But you would hear the people crack your teeth so in the Gullah language. Or rather was. When they get it out, the rest of people are calling it their English. They told me a little bit in Geechee. So we go on all the way from the Atlantic, where the Sea Islands are dated, all the way through the St. John's River and things like that. So I get it out of when they talk about carrying that river back to the North Basin, carrying that river back, but neck up with the rest of the water did it. We always say, right, here, the water to bring me, the water going to take me back. So it's water that is now causing people around the world to come back together collectively, to look at ways in which we can adjust our human behaviors on land and on the sea. And so that we can navigate these floodplains and make sure that the water stays out and the land stays in. <laughs> because as we all know, when we are talking about the current climate changing, we of course are talking about having to be resilient as it changes, but how do we become resilient is by doing the very thing that the title of this session has in it, adapting. The very thing that we are celebrating around the globe this month with Global Adaptation Month. So it's an honor to be the chiefest and head of state for the Gullah Geechee Nation and founder of the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition and a founding member and secretary for the Gullah Geechee Fishing Association to be here to present with the folks at EcoAdapt and with folks that I work with all the time with the National Adaptation Forum. And to also be part of a group called Higher Ground from the Anthropocene Alliance. The Anthropocene word is one that of course doesn't exist in the Gullah Geechee vocabulary but also the word adaptation doesn't, resilience doesn't, and we sure don't retreat. We're not them kind of folks. We don't run. If we hear about a retreat, we mean more like, whoo, woosa, that day at the spa, you see? And why don't those words exist? Because we embody what everyone else in the adaptation field is looking for, resiliency. We live this, this shadow who we be, we would say. So over the four to 500 years that my ancestors have been in North American soil, those are the African ones, but I also have indigenous American ancestors here in the Southeast. And so with all those generations being in the same place and being place-based, quite naturally, our place is natural. So when we talk about nature-based solutions, for us, that is living out our cultural heritage. It means being able to sustain coastal cultural heritage communities and the continued traditions that do not operate on extraction the way much of the Western world does and does not operate on compartmentalizing things. So as you've seen in the previous slides, the levees, and now the levees having to be changed. I studied engineering. So them having to be 
redone so that the water can flow naturally. So as we would say here, on our children are going back to old land mom. So now all we're doing is returning to the way Mother Earth wanted things to be, natural, organic, with the flow and the balance that the Earth was created to have. So our human behavior, the Anthropocene aspect of all of this, is what we really have to navigate changing as well, because that is going to make the difference in regard to our so-called cost benefits analysis and who we protect, where we protect. I agree 100% with the presentations regarding the fact that we have to dismantle racism from these systems. We have to do community participatory engagement and research to analyze what needs to be done where and to then fund what needs to be done. But if we're using cost benefits analysis to only analyze, and I'm a mathematician and computer scientist by degrees, if we're using the math to only calculate values of real estate, then when do we calculate the real value of humans and our cultural communities? Now, you cannot tell me that a building is worth more than a person. So we have to have the Army Corps of Engineers and our global adaptation family begin to have dialogues with the people on the ground. So it's so apropos that Dr. Ralph says that we're talking about talking at the local level and connecting it to the international level. Here in the Gullah Geechee Nation, we have been a part of the UN SDGs from the very beginning. We have our own ocean action plan. We have also been working with con congressional members to get the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act passed so that we can couple our traditional heritage and cultural behaviors in and on the water. The water to us is sacred. The land that we family, the waterway that we bloodline, is how I always say it, with the science the best science that we have at the current time. You heard in the previous presentations, there were ways folks used to think, oh, the levee broke here, well, let's patch the levee. The levee's not firm, let's firm it up again. No, now they realize water <laughs> finds its own level. So why don't we just make more space for it to get to that level? And let us make more space now for all of us to get on the same level, get in the same circle of discussions, get in the flow where we recognize that cultural heritage communities have to be part of the discussion. There's a lived experience and traditional knowledge that can be brought into the science that can then keep all the communities alive. People like to say that the rising tide raises all boats. That could be the bateau boat, that could be the yacht. You see, that could be a skiff, that could be your kayak. It raises it all. Well, now it's time for us to raise up together in terms of us discussing this terminology that we use, adaptation. Now that's to change behaviors to fit certain circumstances. We got that. But also, if you're in the theatrical realm, you know that that adaptation can be what you call the initial components that lay out your screenplay, that you're setting the stage to do a certain thing. So that's what we need to do. And I love the fact that the opening presentation set the stage for coming to me, to the coast, talking about the barrier islands, talking about living shorelines, showing the oyster reefs and the oyster beds. So here in the Gullah Geechee Nation and with the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition on Gullah Geechee.tv and Gullah is G-U-L-L-A-H, Geechee is G-E-E-C-H-E-E.tv. We have several videos that we've released to build community capacity around really overstanding some of these things that we are dealing with. That's why we're here talking about adaptation, such as sea level rise, such as ocean acidification and heat island effect. We live on a sea island, but in our urbanized areas, you have the heat island effect. You then get it compounded with sunny day flooding. So, whew. Can you feel how that would feel to you right there? To be sweating and flooding all at once while the sun is beaming down on you at 90 to 100 degrees. Well, think about it. 
that's a little bit laborious. So I know sometimes our work feels that way. But when we all come together around the globe, working on this together, we can build the kind of capacity through education that's culturally sensitive, culturally relevant, and that brings the community together on the shorelines in one big circle. And so that we live the experience of the change that we need, that we all adapt together around the world so that we raise our perspectives, we raise our communities, and we raise up this concept of global adaptation. So it's such a blessing to have this opportunity to conclude Earth Month in celebration of the conclusion also of Global Adaptation Month by just sharing just a little bit of what are going on here in the Sea Islands, which are those barrier islands where we do have living shorelines and part of the life that lives is cultural heritage. So come, Yeti from we, and learn who we be, and then we can stop that trouble in the water together on the sea. So thank you, thank you for having me. Molly, let's open up the circle to the rest of the Adaptation family. Thank you so much, Queen. Um, okay, so at this point, I'm going to play the, um, the recording from Baruch's presentation. Um, and speaking of, we talked about the oyster reef, so Baruch actually is going to dive into the coral reef restoration project that he's been working on. Um, so thanks again, Queen Klet. Hello, my name is Baruch Rasvala, and I'm the coordinator of the Coastal Ecosystems Program for the Center for Aquamal or Aquamal Ecological Center. Today, I'm happy to be participating in the Global Adaptation Month in this webinar related to nature-based adaptation solutions as a response to climate change. Thanks, Molly, for the invitation, and I would like to share with you about our coral restoration project as a humanitarian tool for the sustainability of coral reef ecosystem services. Well, first of all, I would like to talk a bit about what we do in the organization. Uh, basically, SEA's mission is to produce and promote strategies for sound ecosystem management through research, education, and policymaking for a sustainable development in ACMO. We operate through the implementation of four main programs, two science-based that generate sound data and information that is provided to local stakeholders and authorities to aid in the development of, of proper coastal management policies, and two other that focus on community outreach and volunteer recruitment. Each program coordinates an array of specific projects that aim to describe, monitor, and rehabilitate the local ecosystems. Acumal is located in the north of Quintana Roo in the Yucatan Peninsula and holds many beautiful bays and beaches. It represents one of the most important tourism venues in the country as it holds a local marine trail population that actually can be seen just by snorkeling some few meters off the beach. Uh, it is uh, an important part of the Mexican section of the North American reef system, which is the second largest reef barrier in the world. In specific, the Coral Ecosystems Program operates based on three main components, which is the reef communities monitoring, uh, permanent monitoring of the reef communities through time, involving coral, fish, seagrass, reef bottom cover, among other elements, and between one and three times per year uh, to determine main factors provoking changes on the reef and documenting their effects. The research component, um, besides the internal research projects that uh, generates, the organization works as a research station, offering logistics and technical support to students, academics, and researchers in general to produce sound information regarding aquamal marine ecosystems. And the coral restoration, uh, which is a project focused in the rehabilitation of the reef structure and functions as a tool facing the degradation it has suffered as a consequence of chronic habitat loss driven by human activities and climate change, among other factors. And all these actions working towards the completion of the main objective of the program, which is to promote the conservation and sustainability of the reef communities in Akumal and surrounding zones by the study of their 
health condition through time? Well, basically in 2012, 2013, by the Rift Communities Monitoring, the Coastal Ecosystems Program defined to start working in crowd restoration because we detected a very rapid mortality, mostly of this coral, the Stackhorn coral, Acropora cornis, in the reefs of Acoma. Apart from the coral bleaching that we were detecting years before, that actually was affecting this very species, uh, Acropora cervicornis gets by a lot of by erosion in Acumal because of the rise in the algae cover and it uh, promotes the collapse of the ramets and their eventual death. We also detected what we call the damsel fish effect, which is that these fishes, as they being gardeners, they promote coral mortality by the expansion of their algae mats on which they feed on, all covering the coral life structure. And given that the damsel fish numbers are every time higher because they have lost their natural predators as an effect of overfishing, well, these fishes are really creating havoc on Akumal reefs. What we were doing back in those times was that basically uh, collecting the fragments, the broken fragments that we were seeing on the bottom of, of, the, of the reef, putting them back into the colonies and cleaning out from algae, scraping from algae, the sections of their colonies that were more covered with this. It was until 2015 that we started what we call the Acoma Coral Restoration Initiative. And it was that we put together our efforts with a national NGO uh, and the support of local partners from the tourism sector, mostly hotels and dive shops. Uh, the main success of this initiative and this time period was to establish for the first time a coral restoration management and operation plan in Acoma, unifying the efforts of local population towards implementation of the first Acropora nurseries and to evaluate the feasibility of developing a bigger restoration project for the area. With this collaboration or initiative, we managed to outplant a bit more than 200 fragments of Acropora palmata and Acropora cervicornis establish a couple of Acropora cervicornis nurseries. And actually, SEA in 2017 was based for the Biennial meeting of the Mesoamerican Reef Restoration Network, uh, funded by the Mesoamerican Reef Fund. And in this event, uh, we reunite or gather prominent scientists and specialists on coral reef conservation and coral restoration. So we shared many techniques on coral restoration, monitoring, and outplanting. However, because of the high magnitude of reef damage that it was experimented so far, the project needed to expand in scale and in technical procedures in order to achieve the propagation of thousands of colonies instead of just a few hundred, if we really wanted to rehabilitate the functions and services of the reefs. So since 2018, the project has expanded in collaboration and, and funded by different organizations and having the technical advisory of the National Fisheries Department and with the help of the local community in Acromal, mostly diving centers and hotels and also the inclusion of the academic sector and the involvement of the local community with their participation on activities like maintenance and outland activities. With this collaboration, we managed to consolidate particular techniques, uh, very effective ones in the massive production and installation of coral fragments. So these alliances have been really benefit for us. And uh, this effort was very important to achieve the funding needed to do all these activities. Uh, the Mesoamerican Reef Fund granted us with one year of funding and 
with this money, we also help the National Fisheries Department to improve their laboratories for coral production. Just a video to show you a few activities from the project. Uh, basically, the fragments of coral that we find in the bottom of the, of the sea, the opportunity fragments, are placed in these lines where we stabilize them and we allow them to grow, recovering their health. They are being monitored and we give them proper maintenance to remove all the algae that are growing on top of them. Once they are growing, we uh, refragment them to generate more crawling material and we also take some material from donor colonies that uh, are very healthy and we collect just a little percentage of material from them. We move them with care to the restoration sites and in the meantime we prepare all the materials needed for these restoration activities. So basically in processes uh, very similar to masonry and gardening, we outplant very carefully all these reef fragments, all these coral fragments into the reef spores. And depending on the species of coral, we use different techniques. In some cases, even using uh, artificial structures to provide relief and structure to the new coral recruitment. So each one, each one by one, we place the new coral colonies back into the, the reef in a process that again involves many hands and involves the logistic and technical support of all our partners. Well, some of the goals that we have achieved so far, in one year, basically we obtained the implementation of four coral nurseries together with their restoration zones, uh, seven strategic alliances with different partners, four restoration, massive restoration events, which led to the outplanting of more than 6,000 fragments of eight coral species. If you remember, we were three years before, we we're just managing to outplant some few hundreds. Well, uh, now this effort was really, really big. And well, we did more than 100 dives of outplanting, monitoring, and maintenance activities. And this very intensive effort managed us to have. Uh, more than 75% coral survival rate of our outlands. For the second phase of the project, which is happening since the summer of 2020, well, particularly we are focused on strengthening the social component to achieve the active inclusion of the local actors and stakeholders in the project. To have a series of strategies, the integral strategies that promote the integration of the community, the organic entailment with the community, the sustainability of the project, ensuring the outplanting of more and more coral, massive and sustained coral restoration, and uh, finally, the adoption of the plan from the local stakeholders with the final objective of rehabilitating the reef and achieve the permanence of the ecosystem services of the reefs in Akuma. It is very important for us to achieve all these actions through community participation and to increase the area of coral restored in Akuma and also uh, to make this a very sustainable activity for the local community by the implementation of a payment of ecosyst for ecosystem services program derived from the operation of ecotourism activities which is diving and snorkeling all linked to coral restoration and also with a coral adoption program therefore the hopes for the future and impact of the project would be well mostly the consolidation of the Akumal sustainable coral restoration plan uh, that hopefully will have the capability of being replicated in other localities and that the creation of the local coral restoration committee, the ecotourism and coral restoration programs will ensure the permanence of the coral ecosystem services in a medium and long term. 
and uh, while we consolidate the as well the sustainability and adequate governance of the ecotourism activities with the inclusion of the natural protected areas agency that is the responsible authority for the natural resources administration and management in the zone and well that such actions will benefit the ecosystem health and services the economy of the local community uh, for its continuity with the implementation of this ecosystem services payment program but the most important is to see the rise in awareness le leading to less indirect impact on the global warming on the climate change and less direct impact on the reef ecosystem and this basically would be the generals of the power restoration project that we are implementing i hope you find it interesting and should you have any questions or comments well i'm glad to answer them in the next section uh, if you also are interested into the project please send me an email i will gladly send you information if you want to participate into to this effort Thank you very much for your attention. See you later. So we have one more presentation and I want to say thank you to Baruch for, for sharing about his work. He is on the line with us for a Q&A in a little while. Um, but first we'll hear from Alpha and his work. Thank you all. Uh, greetings all. My name is Alpha Tayomba. I work uh, for Tanzania Healthcare and Environmental Conservation, TASECO, as well as Population and Development Initiative. These two uh, organizations are based in the Kigoma region in Tanzania, and uh, we have made commitments to Global Adaptation Forum for this year to plant trees and conduct some uh, dialogues on climate actions. Uh, I can start by sharing the context of Tanzania as far as forestry and energy uh, is uh, are concerned. Uh, we were uh, concerned about the rate of deforestation in Tanzania. Uh, the rate of deforestation is uh, 4,000, is 400,000 hectares of trees uh, per year. And this, this rate is very serious. And we see that uh, we need to take actions. And the rate is serious because of some uh, human activities like uh, cutting down of trees for cooking, cutting down of trees for construction, uh, construction purposes, cutting down of trees for uh, making charcoal, and uh, some irresponsible beekeepers who reside in the forest and they, they, they do some activities which harm the environment and, and the trees. And the, this deforestation also is caused uh, by small scale miners who cut down trees in order to construct the, the pits. And uh, in some regions like Gaeta region and, and Bea, the, the, the issue is very serious. And uh, the government and the civil society organizations are putting uh, more pressure by introducing some uh, alternative uh, mining uh, methodologies in order to rescue the forests which are available in those areas. And if you see that the fuel consumption is, is, is very high compared to other sources of energy, and this is a very serious, uh, is a very serious case in Tanzania, and that's why we, uh, as local CSOs, we want to make sure that we engage fully and we amplify our voices uh, to the local government authorities and to the people to make sure that they, they fully participate to climate change issues and uh, they, they make sure that the planted trees are appropriate tree species according to the areas which are, are found. Next slide, please. Taiseko is, is uh, just a local CSO which is based in the in Kigoma region. And in this initiative is going to collaborate with the population and the development initiative in order to make sure that we, we, gather, to get, we gather efforts for ad adaptation and mitigation concerning climate change here in Tanzania. 
and the good thing is that we share uh, uh, themes like environmental conservation, water, sanitation, and hygiene, and improved nutrition. And together we have participated in a number of initiatives. Uh, we together promoted the biofortified crops, and these are pro-vitamin A maize, high iron beans, high, uh, high zinc uh, beans, as well as pro-vitamin A maize in order to combat hidden hunger among children under the age of five and women at reproductive age. So we, we have known uh, each other for a long time and we, we want uh, to share our actions, to share our ideas in order to make sure that we amplify the voices concerning climate change actions and we want to advocate for climate change at local context. Next slide, please. Uh, as we know that uh, this April, the Global Ad Adaptation Month, uh, we, we put to, uh, together the efforts of, of tree planting. We put together the efforts of make sure that the youth and the women uh, make dialogues and interactive dialogues to make sure that we call for actions from uh, local government authorities. We call actions from other local uh, CSOs and the other international organizations to work together to make sure that the issues, uh, the serious issues of climate change are addressed properly with the actions at the local levels. And that's why the, there is a need for uh, local uh, organizations to join hands with us for this year's uh, climate change actions and the actions for the future. So together, we as Taheseko and PDI, we are going to, to plant about 400 up to 800 trees this week in two primary schools uh, based in Kigoma and the Morogoro regions in Tanzania. And the whole week, we are going to make sure that we plant the trees together with the environmental clubs at those schools to uh, inspire the young generations uh, to plant trees and to respond to climate change demands and to and actions and he, by collaborating with the schools and the environmental clubs at, at those schools we make sure that we promote environmental conservation to the younger generations and to make sure that they take action uh, in the future so we are going to plant the the trees uh, which are nutritious they will provide shade, shade to the uh, to the pupils and teachers at those schools and the other areas which uh, and other areas which are adjacent to those schools one can ask why trees why we want to contribute to trees why you made a commitment to plant trees trees have biological importance in soils have biological importance to the uh, to the environments and we saw in the previous slide uh, trees even uh, provide uh, nutritious, nutritious food sources and shared to the pupils and teachers at those areas this will be among our contributions to this year uh, climate change actions by the Global Adaptation Forum. And uh, also we are going to have some dialogues in order to make sure that, first of all, uh, the local communities uh, understand the uh, concepts of uh, climate change. They understand the importance of uh, putting trees at the front line of uh, combating climate change and also the use of alternative uh, cooking uh, sources to make sure that uh, the environment is well kept for current and, and future benefits. And these dialogues also will make sure that uh, the CSOs and the other partners uh, like companies uh, think and put into practice the introduction of uh, alternative uh, mining technologies, which will not use uh, harmful chemicals like mercury, and by so doing, they will preserve the environments. And we are going also to, to uh, inspire the small scale miners at our levels to make sure that they also plant trees at the adjacent villages and at those uh, mining areas in order to make sure that uh, they live well within the environment. And also we see that trees also support uh, beekeeping because uh, some areas also use the tree appearance to uh, keep bees and uh, beekeeping in Tanzania is among the income uh, generating activities 
to lots of uh, community members, even in Kigoma and in Morogoro region. Why trees in schools? We want to plant trees in schools because uh, we want to, to make future leaders, to make sure that we have agents of change for climate change issues in Tanzania uh, as well as across the globe. That's why we have engaged these the two schools in order to make sure that we, we have in, in place the future leaders. Deforestation in Kigoma, as I have mentioned, is because of uh, the actions in the mining sites, but also Kigoma the region is the home of a uh, major three refugee camps. And uh, we have the challenges of uh, these refugees to go outside the camps and uh, degrade the adjacent forest near the areas. Of course, they are in need of trees to make, uh, to make the huts uh, for cooking purposes. And that's why there are uh, some local CSOs uh, among the refugee camps, which uh, are addressing uh, this problem through tree, tree planting campaigns in the uh, areas uh, adjacent to the refugee camps. So this is among the, the, the challenges of, of refugees in Kigoma and other uh, socioeconomic issues like uh, building uh, houses and other uh, uh, human activities which use trees. Next slide, please. This is slide which uh, mentioned why uh, massive cutting down of trees is happening because of the mining activities. If you see the photos, if you see the numbers, uh, the, cu the cubic meters which are used for for uh, burning cycle to get limestone, uh, the, the issue is very serious uh, and we need to, to make sure that we plant more trees in order to, to compensate with the, the number of trees which are being cut by the community, uh, communities and the small scale miners. Next slide, please. Yes, in Tanzania and, and in East Africa, the issues of climate change uh, are known and we need to make sure that we take uh, very serious uh, actions by the use of local uh, media, by the use of uh, local CSOs, uh, national and international uh, partnerships in order to make sure that we address these issues through dialogues and practices like the tree planting campaigns. Next slide, please. The work of civil society organization is very crucial as seen in this, uh, in this slide, we see uh, the tree, uh, the members of the tree growers associations here in Tanzania in Nasare. So the civil society organization play a very uh, serious, uh, they take a very serious space to make sure that they fully participate uh, to make sure that people understand the climate change. They take actions like the tree planting and we establish a good number of tree growers associations in order to make sure that the villages and towns have enough uh, tree seed seedlings for tree planting campaigns like we are going to have uh, starting tomorrow. Yes, the challenges of tree planting campaigns in Kigoma region, Morogoro region, and the Tanzania in general. In general uh, the first uh, challenge we see is the knowledge of the people of uh, appropriate tree species according to the areas where they originate, but also we face the uh, issues of financial constraints to purchase the tree seedlings. And also we need to gather together the uh, efforts of environmentalists and the foresters to make sure that the planted trees survive. It's way forward. Uh, the second period, uh, PDI will continue to mo mobilize the resources in order to, to make sure that we have a good number of tree planting campaigns at the local levels. So we as uh, leaders, we are going to uh, share the reports. We are going to share these efforts with the other local uh, CSOs in the Kigoma and the Morogoro region and the Tanzania in general, we are going to share the reports with the international uh, partners to make sure that we partner together to make sure that we develop and we strengthen the tree planting campaigns in the future for a larger impact and for a good, uh, the good uh, number of uh, local partners. By conclu uh, concluding, we see that uh, uh, tree planting uh, campaigns are very important and very serious uh, issue to make sure that uh, we together play a adaptation and mitigation uh, measure in tree planting campaigns. So we need to unite together. We local CSOs, we need to work together with the local government authorities in Kigoma and the Morogo region and Tanzania in general to make sure that we plant more trees and to make sure that we uh, together introduce the alternative methodologies for uh, small scale mining 
the alternative cooking uh, cooking energy uh, and these efforts will together uh, make sure that uh, we work together and we participate fully to climate change adaptation and mitigation now and in the future yeah next slide please so we as uh, Taiseco and, and the PDA, we are going to work with the government authorities and the Tanzania Forest Services to make sure that we have a good number of tree nurseries, to make sure that we have uh, gathered efforts together, to make sure that we, uh, we share our reports and our practices with the other uh, national and the local CSOs in Tanzania to make sure that we together discuss the climate change actions at the local context in Tanzania without forgetting the local communities here in Tanzania. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, these are the efforts uh, which we think uh, are going to be successful as far as tree planting campaigns and climate change uh, are concerned here in Tanzania. So we need to uh, share, we will share the reports with the, the national and international partners. And if there are partners who want uh, to share the resources, to share the uh, technical technologies of tree planting campaigns, they can use the email address which are, are on the slide. And we hope that uh, together, if we work together, we are going to produce good results as far as climate change is concerned in Tanzania and across the globe. Thank you very much. At this point, I'm going to welcome all of our panelists back. And if you can pop back on with your webcam, that would be great. And I want to start off our, our Q&A session. Um, well, first, just, just saying that what I think is powerful from, and I'm really honored to have all these panelists um, with us today, giving perspectives from around the world. Um, I think one thing that just came up as I was listening to each of you is just the power of nature-based adaptation solutions, if they're done right, and how they can address an intersection of issues like well-being, racial and economic justice, food security and nutrition, sustainable development goals, um, cultural heritage, and in infrastructure protection, all of the things. Um, if, if you really are, are thinking about it. I think one of the things I want to ask the presenters, and we'll do a round robin um, just to make sure you can hear from everyone here, um, is what is the biggest challenge you've faced in your implementation of your nature-based solutions work? And I hopefully, if you can, with that, the solution that you found um, or that you're working on to overcome that challenge. Um, and I believe I have Baruch and Alpha also on the phone. So I'm going to start off by asking Baruch if you can answer that question if you're here. Okay, it does, it does look like. Hello, hello, oh. how are you? Oh. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you again for the invitation. And I want to thank also and congratulate the other panelists because they were, their presentations were really interesting. Very interesting to see how different approaches are being implemented in different regions of the world to try to cope with also different effects that we are perceiving from the global warming or the climate change. Uh, well, for, to answer your question uh, regarding which ones are the main challenges that we are facing for our projects. In my case, well, in our case in, in Mexico, in this very region of the Riviera Maya, where we having all this vision of the tourism development, that basically has been following a specific line that is massive tourism and re natural resources depletion while they construct all this hotel uh, infrastructure and all the development that we are having right now in terms of more housings and more residentials and 
hotel areas, um, golf courts, for example, all these, all the impacts that all this uh, huge development is having around the touristic areas really imposed a, a big challenge because we need to change the vision of how this development is being uh, implemented for the last 50 years. And actually, the unification or the contribution of many other organizations working towards conservation and, and uh, sustainable development uh, is been working uh, finally in, in some aspects because many of the hotels and other uh, investors and development are facing the problems or the issues that this is uh, having on, on the coral reefs and the coastal line, for example. So I think the yeah the biggest the biggest challenge is to change the language and change the vision of tourism around here and start to implement integral projects, uh, including the local communities in every aspect uh, to improve all the infrastructure that is being developed in the in the area uh, to a more natural and more uh, environmental friendly uh, infrastructure and also to implement what is needed in terms of urban expansion and all the sewage that is being created uh, among all this increasing population that we are having because of, uh, of the tourism. I think more or less is uh, what, what we need to do for the next 10 years at least <laughs> to start to be seeing a, an impact on the on the health of the ecosystems in the coastal town. And also to plant a lot of more coral <laughs> because we are losing it like really, really in a really quick manner because of the coral bleaching and all the diseases as a synergic actions uh, or effects from from what's happening on land and also with the increase in temperature of the sea. Yeah, from what I'm hearing you saying is if you're if you don't address the, the root causes of the the um, coral reef degradation, then you won't be able to do your work as well of of building them back up and restoring them because it'll just keep damaging them. Yeah, exactly. Um, great. Uh, Alpha, are you on the line? And do you want to add anything about challenges you face in your work? Yeah, thank you very much. As uh, I showed in the presentation, there are challenges for tree planting campaigns here in Tanzania. First of all, we need uh, the resources to make sure that we fully participate in tree planting campaigns and we fully participate in climate change uh, initiatives at a local context. So when you want to plant trees, we need tree seedlings. And uh, the pandemic uh, has uh, caused a good number of uh, local CSOs here in Tanzania. They don't have, they don't have uh, enough uh, financial resources for purchasing the, the tree seedlings and uh, as well as uh, conducting other, other, other activities as far as environmental conservation is concerned. So a, a good support uh, will be the resources. And when I, 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 I mention resources, I mean uh, both technical and the financial. So if we receive uh, small uh, grants, uh, we are going to fully implement the tree planting campaigns in Tanzania, and we are going to reach the, the, the tree growers associations with knowledge and also we are going to reach uh, the community members with the appropriate tree species and the appropriate uh, tree planting methodologies so that they can plant the trees which grow well in the, uh, in the local areas. That is uh, number one. But also we need to engage with uh, national and international organizations to uh, make sure that we have a good number of uh, agents of change in Tanzania and globally. And when we have a good number, a good number of agents of change, it means uh, uh, those are gathered efforts. And if uh, they together join efforts, 
they will work hard, they will uh, share the resources, they will share information concerning tree planting campaigns uh, at a global levels. And if they come together, uh, they, can, they can share uh, what they, they have as far as climate change and tree planting campaigns is concerned. So uh, we need, uh, uh, we are in need of resources and we are in need of uh, uh, technical materials to make sure that we, we plant the appropriate tree species and to make sure that we have a good number of agents of change in climate change issues and tree planting campaigns here in Tanzania and the other East African countries. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Alpha. All right, let's um, pass it over to, I guess, Queen Crest. Thank you, thank you. I was hoping I would go next because my first thought when you asked the question was resourcing, financial resourcing in particular. And I figured that would be everybody's answer that that's one of the greatest challenges we have face. So I just wanna put that one up front. But then the other part in, in our case has been the inclusion of cultural heritage in adaptation planning. Because that has not been successfully included because of a lot of what was stated earlier, people looking at cost benefits analysis formulas, looking at real estate, looking at tourism, looking at everything except how to sustain the cultural heritage communities that are already in place, who are place-based, who live from these same elements of nature, live within nature, and many times live like we do and balance with nature. And you're excluding them from the planning process and excluding them from planning for their future. Instead, you're thinking about people moving in or visiting. And so one of our greatest things that showed me some hope and light that now there are people interested in focusing on our cultural heritage here in the coast was a number of things, not only the Ocean Based Solutions Act and Congress that I mentioned, but now 30 by 30 planning happening in South Carolina and various other states here in the Gullah Geechee Nation, especially. And then having us have an issue right next to my home island, St. Helena Island, there's a place called Bay Point. And when we fought against destructioneers that wanted to bring in an exclusionary luxury resort that you have to take a boat to. But now this is an area that floods on a king tide constantly. There are no homes there for a reason. It is fishing ground. It is a bird sanctuary. It's a number of things. And that's why we leave it sustained as it is traditionally. And now these people set their eyes on it saying, well, we're an international conglomerate and we thought that'd be a perfect place and we'll bring people in by you know, ferries and helicopters to go there to the tune of $3,000 a night. Well, that $3,000 per person could go into ecological education and biodiversity and sustainability and adaptability in the county instead of having someone do that. So we brought together over 30,000 people. It was the largest opposition to any destruction near project in my lifetime and in the history of my county. And it was because so many people were now concerned and fully vested and not just the environment, but making sure Gullah Geechee culture survives and thrives in this environment. So they are rethinking what should be allowable to be built where when we first said 30 years ago don't build in these places because it's not sustainable we are the barrier islands we are the maritime forest we protect the mainland of quote unquote america people said you all are emotional natives that's a quote and they would ignore what we were saying even though i'm a scientist pointing things out to them showing them things and now we have words for them and I'm hoping now people will use these words with us and do adapt and do become resilient, but protect these cultural heritage communities. So I do see some hope on the horizon because of this whole world that got in here with us and said, no, it's important to protect Bay Point right there on St. Helena, even if they hadn't seen it yet, but they realized it would help keep the ecological balance here. So I appreciate that and I appreciate all of what he said because we deal with the same things you're dealing with there. Thanks, Queen Quet. I'm gonna pass it to Ralph. We'll work our way backwards. Sorry, Natalie. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I really agree with the Queen. Um, I, I really like how she's pointing out this, also how she talks about um, the weather almost like being a, a, a living entity. Uh, and I think we have to go uh, a little bit back to that. And of course, the challenge is then to uh, to balance that with the economic value that is present in many developed countries and the large system. So, so I think that, uh, especially for smaller streams, it really applies what, uh, what 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 the Queen is saying. And you fortunately see that happening in a lot of uh, in a lot of countries. I think for now, the the, the main challenge is to show that nature-based solutions really work that they have these benefits uh, for restoration purposes. And way too often, uh, local governments, but also the more um, national governments, they turn to concrete-like solutions or mix of grey-green solutions where they still, where they better could apply nature-based solutions because of the many core benefits. But in order to really show this, you have to get, you, you have to have, um, or you have to get scientific evidence. And that means that you look at all the nature-based solutions, make an inventory of, the, of that, and really write down the benefits that these solutions have, and then promote that to the local and national governments, so that whenever there is, again, some decision to be made, that you can say, please also have a look at the nature-based solutions, because they really solve your problem, and apart from that, they have many core benefits uh, part of, of which the Queen is speaking about, but also increasing natural values, increasing biodiversity, increasing increasing the well-being of 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 of, of humanity almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And and I'll be real quick since I know we're we're close on time. The biggest challenge is time. Um, mm -hmm. Climate change is going to cause society to shift and change quicker than it ever has in history. And we're going to have to react and plan and be prepared for what's coming um, in a very short time frame. So time is the biggest challenge. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, that's a really good point to close us on. Um, I'll just wrap us up, and then if if our presenters want to have some final words, we'll we'll go over a little bit. But um, just just a reminder. So as as Queen quite nicely um, told us. This is all a part of Global Adaptation Month, and that's why we're hosting this session. And so um, for those who are watching who are interested in making their own commitment, um, you can do so in the link that Catherine put in the chat. Um, and also, we'd appreciate, if possible, if you could support the continuation of this program um, by making a donation. Um, the link's also in the chat there. But I do want to circle back and just let everyone um, get into some last thoughts that you really want the audience to take away um, from your work and just in general your thoughts on nature-based adaptation solutions. So um, I guess going back to Natalie and you can start us off. Um, I mean, I, honestly, for everybody here, enjoy the nature and, you know, embrace it as Queen says um, and, and really understand not only its beauty but what it does for us i i will add to that understand the system that we are living in understand the dynamics of the river and try to align with that mm -hmm. i first want to just thank you molly for such a great job pulling us all together and thank everyone who was part of this and did great and i it's a blessing to me today because to see Louisiana where I have Queen Quet Day, to have Mississippi where there are Gullah Geechees, to see Amsterdam and Scotland on the other slides where I've been to all these places and celebrated with the communities, the nature that they love there. And so I feel like if we all continue to celebrate together around the globe, the nature that we love in these different spaces, even Puerto Rico, I've been there several times, that we will be able to all adapt together to realizing that we are nature, nature is us. And so, as I always say, as the Gullah Geechee Sea Island Coalition slogan, Puna must take care of the root to heal the tree. So y'all keep digging deeper and bring together the circle of the global adaptation family. Thank you, thank you. Y'all please follow us too at gullahgeecheeland.com and join in all the work we're doing here. Thank you. And any last words, Farouk? You're still here. 
I just to thank again for the invitation and thank thank everyone or the panelists. Uh, I'm taking like very important concepts with me to uh, apply it to our work. And yeah, as you said, let's keep it working and facing how we can with all our resources, all these uh, these issues that they're gonna be really tough next time. But uh, we're without our efforts and unity, we can make a, a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks again to our panelists. Um, on behalf of those, well, to those still listening, um, on behalf of EcoAdapt, I hope you have a really great rest of your day and look forward to hearing your comments in the post of session survey as well. So thanks again, all. Bye. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you, Molly.